Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Everybody focused on Halloween temperatures, but look what's on its way for tomorrow. 70s will be here. We'll tell you how long they're going to last. All right, Ben, we'll look forward to it. And Battleground, Michigan. Take a look. Both campaigns barnstormed the state. Donald Trump making multiple stops and the Clinton campaign pulling out a Hollywood heavyweight to help them get out the vote. But first, developing news right now, we're getting our first look at the man now charged with killing a Detroit police officer in a deadly hit and run crash. Good to have you with us for Local 4 News at 5 on this Halloween. Stephen Guzina stood silent today as the judge rattled off a long list of charges against him. That's right. In all, Guzina faces seven of them, including second degree murder in the death of Officer Myron Jarrett. He's an eight year veteran of the force. Let's get right to Coco McAvoy. She was in the courtroom for the arraignment today. Coco, some brand new information came to light. Can you share that with us? That's right, Carmen and Devin. We learned more information about what Stephen Gazina was allegedly doing that night. The assistant prosecutor saying that he was buying crack cocaine, then smoking it, and then driving under the influence of that drug when he hit and killed Officer Myron Jarrett. So now he's facing a number of serious charges in Jarrett's death. Please repeat your name, sir. Stephen Patrick Gazina. Stephen Gazina in court for the first time wrapped in a blanket and appearing out of it after being charged in the tragic death of Officer Myron Jarrett. Did you hear the charges against you and the penalties that you could receive? Yes, yes. A long list of charges, including driving while intoxicated, causing death. This defendant drove around the city purchasing crack cocaine, smoking it, drove around some more, purchased some more crack cocaine, smoked it again, traveling at a high rate of speed. Also charged with running away from the scene and second degree murder. Deputy Chief David Lavalley saying the murder charge doesn't stem from an intent to kill, but instead. Oh, it appears as though his condition that night and what his actions throughout the day had been led to this occurring. Now, Gazina's case will move through the court system while the Detroit Police Department continues to mourn the death of their fellow officer, Myron Jarrett. He, along with many, many other officers throughout the entire country, especially here in Detroit, uh, really risk a lot when they go out and everything that they think might be a routine event uh, isn't. Just very tragic. And you probably remember hearing that Stephen Gazina was with another woman during that hit and run crash. Well, officers did find her this morning at the hospital and they spoke to her and she's not facing any charges at this time. But Stephen Gazina, he'll be back in court in a couple of weeks for a conference and a preliminary hearing. Reporting live this afternoon from the 12th Precinct, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. And Coco, what about the family of Officer Jared? Uh, what are they saying at this time? Well, Carmen, you know, it's obviously a very difficult time for this family. I did speak briefly with Jared's son, who has created a GoFundMe page, just asking for any help with funeral expenses and things of that nature. So if you'd like to help, we'll, of course, have a link on our website. Click on Detroit.com. Carmen. All right, and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with them. Coco McAvoy reporting for us now. Well, another disturbing discovery sends shockwaves through the Eastern Michigan University community. Today, more racist graffiti aimed at African Americans was found spray painted on the east side exterior of Ford Hall. EMU police responded to the scene. The graffiti was immediately removed, but police are still investigating similar incidents from late September. Workers at Ford World Headquarters hardly got their work week started the day before it came to an abrupt end. That's right. It was an electrical fire in the building's basement that prompted evacuation and cancellation of the rest of the workday. Now you can see in this video from Sky 4 all the workers outside the building. Guy Gordon shows us what happened and what workers did to still get the day's work done. Guy? This all started about 9.15 this morning when a fire detector was activated in the basement of the glass house. Upon arrival, firefighters did find a large panel smoking heavily. Originally, just two floors were evacuated as a precaution. But when the size and extent of the fire was determined, a full building evacuation was ordered. 1,500 people work in the glass house, but many had yet to arrive to work. Some came out of the building lugging their laptops. Trying to do a little business while I you're out here. Look at my fire out here. There were no injuries, just inconvenience. A tent for employee test drives became a makeshift warming hut 
as that evacuation wore on. Dearborn Fire quickly moved in and knocked down the blaze. Electrical panel down inside under the building that was smoking. Was, um, we made entry, uh, made sure that uh, we contacted DTE. Uh, Ford Motor Company had also contacted DTE to shut the power off to the, that area of the building. Electrical fires have a nasty habit of creeping through conduits, so thermal imaging was used to ensure the fire didn't travel beyond that electrical panel. Emergency generator power restored electricity to part of the building so workers could get to upstairs offices, collect belongings and work before heading home. This building is celebrating its 60th anniversary and like a lot of the buildings on the Dearborn Ford campus is set to undergo major renovations including plumbing and electrical over the next few years and it looks like they may have just gotten a jump start on the electrical. From Ford World Headquarters in Dearborn, I'm Guy Gordon, Local 4. All right, thank you, Guy. Well, it's just about time for all the little trick-or-treaters yeah. and some of the big ones, too, to head out and grab all the candy they can. Ben, I think it's one of the most important forecasts of the year, <laughs> isn't it? Hey, no pressure here, right? Uh, temperatures right around 50 degrees, but I'll tell you that the average highs this time of year, mid-50s, we're not far from that. And everything else is going in our favor. We don't have precipitation in the forecast. The winds are going to remain light and these numbers are going to st steadily fall as we get into a crisp evening. But the good thing is, is we're starting to see a lot of these middle level clouds break up, uh, especially down here south and in our west zone. Uh, so there'll be a few pre peaks of sunshine as we head towards the end of the evening and that could help temperatures at least remain steady. We're not going to see much of a drop tonight as those fall into the mid 40s. But wait till you see what's coming in the four zone forecast for tomorrow. That's in just a few minutes, guys. All right, then now to decision 2016 and Michigan has become a popular stop on the <laughs> campaign trail with just yeah. eight days to go. Tim Kaine here in Warren yesterday. Today, even more visitors. Donald Trump uh, made stops first in Grand Rapids, now holding a rally right now in Warren. We'll get to him. In the meantime, the Democrats are sending Cher across the state. She's stumping for Hillary Clinton. She made a stop in East Lansing and is set to hold a rally in Flint in less than an hour. Paula Tutman in Flint ahead of Cher's visit. We'll get there in a second. Let's start though with Mara in Warren. Uh, Donald Trump has just taken the stage, Mara. A little bit of a delay. <laughs> A big delay, Devin. We're talking about nearly two-hour delay. He just got introed by Bobby Knight, so let's take a listen. He just hit the podium. You know, when I wanted to win, you know, when I wanted to win the great state of Indiana, a friend of mine said, any way you can get Bobby Knight to endorse you. When I got Bobby Knight, that was the end of that, I'll tell you what. In eight days, we are going to win the great state of Michigan, and we are going to win back the White House. Real change begins with immediately repealing and replacing Obamacare. It's a disaster. It's just been announced that Michigan residents are going to experience a massive double-digit premium hike in Obamacare. I will not tell you the number. I know the number, but I want everybody to leave here happy. But you'll be happy because we'll repeal it, we'll replace it, we're going to get you something so good. So much less expensive, so much better. You know it's called? It's better and less expensive. That's a good combination. The great state of Arizona, great place, just left. We have a crowd of several thousand people inside here at Macomb Community College. Uh, they actually had to turn away nearly 400 people at the door because, as you can see, this venue is absolutely jammed. I expect Trump to speak for about another hour, but I don't think this is the last we're going to see of this campaign this week, Devin Carmen. I mean, we're hearing that we're going to see Trump surrogates here all week, which means that which means that they think that they have a shot here. I'm sure that the Hillary Clinton supporters who are with Paula Tubman right now would dispute that greatly. Paula, has Cher arrived yet? No, she hasn't. In fact, uh, she's expected to arrive at about 5.30. You can see that there is a crowd right here which actually wraps around this building. This is UAW 6, local 651, I should say. They, uh, Cher's been actually crisscrossing the state. I shouldn't say crisscrossing, I should just say moving from west to east. She started in Keizu, went to uh, East Lansing, 
is here in Flint at about 5.30, expected to really try to get people to work on getting out the vote. They've also been signing up volunteers as well. Flint, uh, Shares had quite an interest in Flint, sent about 180,000 bottles of water. Feels very, very strongly about this area. Uh, tonight, she moves to uh, West Bloomfield. She goes to the home of a popular attorney, uh, Jumana Keru, for a fundraiser, $5,000. You get to say you're a co-host. $1,000, you get to meet Cher and get a picture with her as well. So very, very busy in the state of Michigan, which has been fluctuating from blue to light blue to blue to light blue, a very, very important state in this election. Guys, back to you. Quite a lot behind right, Paul. Just eight days to go. Yeah. And ahead here at 530, brand new developments in the renewed investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails and the response from the White House that has a lot of people surprised today. That's coming up at six o'clock. Well, we know last night was Angels Night and Detroit is on track. We're glad to tell you to continue seeing less fires during Halloween. Detroit's fire department is sharing the numbers with us today. They show fire crews have responded to 38 fires since the start of the Angel Nights campaign. That was two days ago. That is a significant drop. Total number of fires was 52 last year, and that was down from the 97 fires in 2014. Downward trend said to be because of the thousands of Angels Night volunteers. Hats off to all of them. Absolutely. Well, Defender Kevin Dietz is working on a special report for you for 530. Kevin? Not so fast. Prosecutor Kim Worthy sends the parole board a stern letter saying former Inkster police officer William Melendez needs to stay behind bars. The story is coming up. All right, Kevin, and a real homegrown success story. This Detroit business making a big move after close to a century in the same spot. We'll tell you where they're headed and why it's such a big deal ahead at 5. It's new at six. They were declared the winner. They celebrated. And then the Troy Athens boys soccer team was told they didn't win after all. At least not yet. We'll explain at six o'clock. Plus, they're back and taking samples in Flint. What the scientists from Virginia Tech are saying about the water crisis there and the health of the people who've been through it. It is Halloween and the trick-or-treaters beginning their start here anytime. Oh, are you kidding? They can hardly wait. Happy Halloween to both of them. Well, thank you. You too. You know, this is a kind of a tough forecast for meteorologists because everybody's got a different idea of what they want. Oh, well, this is true. We yes. want candy. Yes. Well, <laughs> go ahead. I know you have the, he's got how's the weather. The, how's the candy I'm, outlook? Well, I'm out of that. <laughs> but I do have good weather, so maybe that'll suffice uh, for right now. We're starting to see those clouds break a little bit. Uh, this is one of our uh, tower cam shots from Mount Clemens, and you can see where the sun is uh, starting to show, its, uh, show itself uh, out there in the left corner of your screen. But it's not going to warm up temperatures all that much. It's just going to keep them from dropping all that fast. We're 50 degrees, and we're likely going to stay here through probably about the next hour or so. Good news on the wind front. It's noticeable out there at about 10 miles an hour, but we'll see these winds decrease tonight. So not going to be an issue with that as we go into trick-or-treating. Most of us are going to finish things out depending on how much candy you're going to be out there grabbing uh, likely in the mid or even upper 40s in some cases. Now looking at current temperatures out here to the southwest, this is what's on its way for tomorrow. 73 right now in St. Louis, 75 in Kansas City. We will likely see the mid 70s in parts of the area once we get into tomorrow afternoon and remember that our Record high temperature tomorrow is 81, so we'll probably fall short of that, but only by about five, six degrees once we head into the afternoon. Here's a look at uh, storm pins, which looked a lot more spooky this morning uh, than it does out there right now. You can see some of the fog out there on the lake this morning. Uh, appreciate that shot on storm pins. And as far as the clouds go, they're uh, starting to break up. You can't really tell on in the infrared uh, uh, image right now, but we're starting to see more of those breaks around southeast Michigan. Don't worry about the wet weather. We're going to stay dry tonight. We do have some rain in the forecast though midweek, and once we get through tonight, those clouds will thin a little bit here by 8 o'clock, coming back as we head towards the midnight hour and likely staying overcast or at least mostly cloudy for the majority of tomorrow. That is going to even uh, 
keep a lid on temperatures more so than what we would have seen had the sunshine come out. We would have been looking at 80 degrees by the afternoon, but I think mid 70s will have to suffice. And as far as the rain goes on Wednesday, we'll be seeing those showers develop uh, probably just after lunchtime and staying with us for a good portion of Wednesday. 44 tonight for the low temperature highs tomorrow will hit 74, but as far as our four zone forecast goes, We'll start out in the metro zone. Look at some of these numbers tomorrow afternoon. 74 in Dearborn, Detroit, Romulus, you'll see the same number. Warmest temperatures down here, and if we get more sunshine than what we're planning on, it could even be 78 in parts of our south zone. West zone anywhere between 70 and 74. And in our north zone, some 60s out there, especially closer to the lake, but inland areas are going to warm up to the 70s by the afternoon. And we will be back to a more of a normal forecast once we head into Thursday and the upcoming weekend. And don't forget, we're going to fall back as daylight saving time comes to an end Saturday night. And uh, first day, we're going to see 37 degrees when we wake up on Sunday morning. So do we still really need to do that this whole clock. Probably thing? not. No, no. Well, I look forward to that extra. Really? Hour, don't you? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Just depends on what you did Saturday <laughs> take, night. That's, that's all, exactly that's all right. Saying. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, in other news, police say she was drunk and driving the wrong way down I-75, but that isn't even half the story. The unusual thing police found when they finally got her to pull over. But first, a week-long manhunt comes to a deadly conclusion. What police say this man was in the process of carrying out right before they caught him next. A week-long manhunt for an accused killer in Oklahoma ended in a shootout with the fugitive dead and a county sheriff wounded. Police say Michael Vance murdered two family members and wounded two police officers outside Oklahoma City and then committed a string of crimes as he posted live messages on Facebook. But police cornered Vance Sunday in western Oklahoma. Vance, who faced child sexual abuse charges, was killed in a fierce gun battle with police. Uh, it's a huge relief, not only for us, but I'm sure for uh, the public as well. This guy has been uh, on a pretty bad crime spree for the last several days and uh, I'm sure that the citizens of this state are relieved that this has come to a conclusion. A county sheriff was wounded in his arm and shoulder in the gunfight with Vance but is expected to recover from those injuries. Jury selection started the day in the murder trial of a former South Carolina police officer caught on camera fatally shooting an unarmed black man. Well, Michael Slager was an officer with the North Charleston Police Department. The jury being chosen will have to decide if he's guilty in the shooting death of Walter Scott. Well, Scott was killed by Slager in April of last year when he tried to run away after being pulled over for a broken taillight. The shooting later came to light thanks to a bystander who recorded it on his cell phone. And new reward is now being offered to find the driver who hit and killed a college student. 17-year-old Ryan Saitsos was a freshman at Central Michigan University, but he was walking near the campus when a driver struck him and just kept going. It happened November 1st last year. Now as the one-year anniversary of his death approaches, a cash reward is being increased to $10,000 for any information leading to the driver's arrest. Anyone with information can call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-SPEAK. Decision 2016, Hillary Clinton spoke out on the renewed FBI probe of her emails, charging that the Bureau is, and this is her quote, jumping into an election with no evidence of wrongdoing. Meantime, Donald Trump warned of a trial and a constitutional crisis if voters were to elect Clinton. Steve Handelsman getting to the bottom of all of it today from Washington. Steve? Devin, Clinton warned that voters could be distracted from what she said ought to decide this election. Trump's found what he hopes is a new way to get lukewarm Clinton supporters to stay home. Donald Trump went to Michigan where he figures he now has a shot. Thank you, Uma. What's on top Clinton aide Huma Abedin's and her estranged husband's laptop, Trump says, will take Hillary down. We can be sure that what is in those emails is absolutely devastating. Hillary Clinton was in Ohio objecting to the renewed investigation. Why in the world the FBI would decide to jump into an election with no evidence of any wrongdoing with just days to go? There is no case here. An FBI team is rushing to report before November 8th. A law enforcement source says the laptop has 650,000 emails that Abedin says she did not know were on it. 
The probe began last night, agents with a warrant using software tools to isolate Clinton-related State Department emails and determine how many are duplicates of emails the FBI's had for months, how many, if any, are new, and if any of those have classified content. President Obama today, in a blow to Clinton, gave the head of the FBI a pass. The president is completely confident that Director Comey has not taken any steps to try to intentionally influence the outcome of the election. Trump is warning if Clinton wins, she could be put on trial, sparking a constitutional crisis. Today's NBC News Survey Monkey online poll finds so far Trump not helped and Clinton not hurt by this email surprise. She kept the six point national lead that she had before the FBI announced its renewed investigation. From Washington, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve, and we're doing something special on election night for users of the Click on Detroit app. Of course, we'll be sending out push alerts for all of the major races, but this year we will also be sending out push alerts for the local races that are of particular interest to you. So download the Click on Detroit app for free in your app store. Just search WDIV. New at 530. If a child with autism or any special need knocks on your door, trick-or-treating tonight, do you know what to do? The one bit of advice experts have to ensure that everyone has fun. We'll have that story just ahead at 530. Hank? A Detroit family living in unlivable conditions. Take a look at the video. They have been in this home without any running water for almost two weeks. That is until Help Me Hank comes to the rescue. You'll see our story coming up new tonight. Former Inkster police officer William Melendez is hoping to get out of prison before Christmas. But prosecutor Kim Worthy has other ideas. See the letter she just filed with the Michigan Parole Board. The story is next. From Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 530 starts now. Kim Worthy comes out swinging in the Inkster police brutality case. The stinging rebuttal she has for the parole board ahead of William Melendez's possible parole. Topic our news at 5.30. The local four defenders have obtained a letter Worthy sent to the parole board members ahead of this possible release. That's right, four pages listing every possible reason why he should stay behind bars. Let's get to Kevin Dietz. He joins us now. And Kevin, first off, where do things stand with his parole status now? Well, Mr. Melendez has been granted conditional parole, which means if all goes well, he could be home by Christmas. At least that was the situation before Kim Worthy sent this letter to the parole board, a letter the defenders obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. The letter is straightforward and signed by Prosecutor Kim Worthy herself using capital letters for emphasis saying, quote, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office opposes this parole and would ask the board to reconsider its decision. I am truly sorry that you believe my actions were unjust. Please have faith in your law enforcement officers, for many of them would risk their life for yours. That was William Melendez at sentencing as he stood by a story that his actions were justified. In the prosecutor's letter, she points to Melendez's brutality towards motorist Floyd Dent as a reason he should stay locked up, writing, the victim in this case was treated with excessive brutality. The video admitted at trial shows the defendant using excessive force to brutalize Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent was unarmed, never fought back, never struck the defendant, and was unsuccessful in attempting to protect himself from the defendant's unrelenting attack. Furthermore, the defendant interfered with the administration of justice. In this case, the defendant purposefully lied in a police report, committed perjury in a search warrant. It was left up to me. I'd give him 15 years, okay, all the uh, lying and humiliation and, and everything he done, and he's supposed to be uh, uh, an officer of the law, you know, come on. On the eve of sentencing, Dent hoped the judge would send a strong message, but she went below guidelines, sentencing Melendez to 13 months to 10 years. Now the parole board says Melendez could be let out as early as December 15th. The prosecutor saying she believes that would send the wrong message, writing, the defendant's incarceration was due to his absolute betrayal of the trust and authority placed in him to protect the community and uphold the laws of this state. His actions have had a severe detrimental impact on both the police community and the community at large. 
And the prosecutor's letter also says that Floyd Dent never registered with the victim's unit and therefore never had a chance to weigh in with the parole board. He is now in the process of registering and hopes to be heard on this matter before that release date. Kevin Dietz, Defenders. Kevin, let's say the parole board is persuaded by the prosecutor's letter. How much more prison time could that mean for Melendez? Yeah, the parole board can really do whatever they want. They could completely ignore this letter. Mm -hmm. They could go all the way up to 10 years, which was the maximum by the judge. N neither of those are likely. Uh, one of the parole board members did suggest maybe 18 more months time. So maybe that's a number they will look at. But this is one of those we'll really have to wait and see after they yeah. hear all the evidence what they're going to do. All right. I know you'll stay on top of it. Our Kevin Dietz reporting for us live. Well, a 34-year-old woman is now facing possible jail time after police said she caused a crash while driving in the wrong direction on I-75. It was quite a story. Police also said Rochelle Walsh was drunk and nude as she drove north in the southbound lanes of I-75 in Bay County. She eventually crashed into another driver. This was uh, from September. Walsh was arrested and charged Friday with a count of operating a vehicle while intoxicated and facing a possible five years in prison. Getting very close to prime time now for trick-or-treating on this Halloween. Halloween oh, 2016. Yes, it is. And it may be on the chilly side, but hopefully we won't see any rain, Ben. No, uh, we're expecting dry conditions. Carmen and Devin, and uh, we've got the green lights as far as the weather goes for trick or treating tonight. Temperatures right around 50 degrees will be falling, but very slowly uh, as we get through the night tonight. In fact, wind speed's not going to be much of an issue. This is probably as fast as we're going to see those about 10, maybe 13, 14 miles an hour. And we'll see those subside as we get through tonight. So your freaky forecast will get us into the 40s. But even by 9 o'clock when we hit 46, probably won't fall very far from that and may even see numbers coming up as we head towards morning. This is all ahead of a big warm up tomorrow. We'll run that down for you in just a few minutes. Did you really say freaky forecast? All right, we'll get back to Ben in just a moment. But you know, for close to a century, advanced plumbing and heating has called this building across from the Motor City Casino home. And over those 97 years, this company has become a real homegrown success story. Our Steve Garagiola shows us how they're growing up and moving out. Steve? Pipes, pumps, faucets, fittings, plumbing supplies. And this is news because because it's a great Detroit success story. Advanced plumbing and heating supply served the city for 97 years from this old building on Grand River. There's some real history here. It was there before they built the Lodge Freeway. When they built the Lodge Freeway, my grandfather gave three quarters of his building to the state so they can build the Lodge Freeway. Today they celebrate a new location in Midtown because the plumbing business in Detroit has changed from fixing old and broken to supplying fresh and new. In the last 50 years, we were basically repairing the city of Detroit. We were selling pipes and valves and fittings just to repair the city of Detroit. But over the last several years, we're, we're not only repairing the city of Detroit, but we are now rebuilding the city of Detroit. Four generations in this business, Jeffrey feels a sense of pride that his family stuck it out in the dark years when so many others ran from Detroit. My father was happy in the city of Detroit. This was his place. You know, he worked here forever. He knew his customers. It was challenging, challenging times, obviously, and, and they stuck it out. Their new building preserves some Detroit history also, which they'll honor when they complete construction of the showroom. We are going to recreate the historical facade that was once on Cass Avenue. It was an automotive dealership in 1918, and it had a beautiful car in the front window. Thank you. Welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you, Dad. Today, other Midtown business owners stopped in to say welcome to the neighborhood, maybe for another 97 years. I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4. Oh, I think Grandpa would be proud, don't you think? And a lot of those businesses that have stuck it out and been able to go through some tough times deserve a lot of credit for, okay. for the perseverance. Hey, that's Absolutely the Detroit right. Detroit spirit. Yeah. Uh, some very talented people compete to come up with some of the most insane pumpkin carvings. That's right. New tonight, we'll tell you who's behind these out of this world designs and why this competition uh, ended up getting way out of hand. We'll be back in a moment. Hey. Okay? A Detroit woman desperate for help, her family without any water. That is until we get involved. Here's something I had no control over, and there's nothing I can do but sit and be a victim. Tonight, it's Help Me Hank to the Rescue, and we're going to show you exactly what went wrong here in this situation and how you can make sure it never happens to you. New tonight.
All right, Hank, but first, passengers called it the flight from hell. Why this flight was delayed for seven hours had nothing to do with the plane nor the weather. It's next. No tricks. Just New at six. Finding a good apartment in the southeast Michigan area can be a difficult challenge. This was a nice apartment building, but the residents here, and one in particular, says it's really gone downhill, and she's fearing for her life. We'll tell you why I hit. All right, Rod. Also, he had inside access at several Ford Motor Company buildings in the area. New at six, what police say this man stole over and over again. A possible bomb threat delayed a Spirit Airlines flight in Florida. The pilot of the flight declared an emergency at the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport on Sunday. Passengers said two men were escorted off after someone reported seeing one of the men writing a text message referring to a bomb. Now, according to the airport spokesman, the pilots declared an emergency shortly after the messages were reported. The investigation continues. Tonight, Help Me Hank comes to the rescue of a Detroit family living without water in their home. If you can imagine, the issue also rounded some confusion between the management company and the Detroit Water Department. But thankfully, after Hank got involved, the water started flowing again. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester joins us live and DWSD acted here pretty quickly, didn't they, Hank? Devin Carmen, they absolutely did once we made the phone call. As you can imagine, this was a very dangerous situation, one that we are happy to report now has been resolved. This is to Channel 4 and help me Hank. Cheers. A toast for clean water, a celebration in the Dodd home. I am so grateful because nobody would have helped me. Nobody gave me any answers. And if it wasn't for you and Channel 4, we wouldn't be in the position that we are in now. We first met Janisha Dodd last week. She was renting this Detroit home with her family and says when the new management company took over, her water was abruptly shut off. We learned the issue was that the rental company had not filed the proper paperwork to get the tenant's name on the bill. Janisha was stuck, but after calling Help Me Hank, we went searching for answers. No one at the offices of Peace of Mind Property Management Rental in Detroit, but we did reach a manager on the phone who promised to take care of this problem right away. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to go, I'm going to take care of her water and make sure everything is good for her and I'm going to send her a notice. Days later, the paperwork finally filed. DWSD on the scene restoring service and inside the home, a family that had been without any running water for more than two weeks take a moment to enjoy something many may take for granted, clean running water in their home. I would <laughs> encourage everybody to not take advantage or take for granted what we have because once it's gone, it's you the hardest thing. You don't know how thing. we feel. My mother cried. That's not good. That is not good. That's exactly why we had to work to make sure that situation was resolved. Again, almost two weeks without running water. Thankfully, the neighbors stepped in and helped. And you could see four children there. It was a very challenging time for that family. We're live tonight. Hank Winchester, back to you. Well, Hank, if you're if you are renting, how do you make sure you don't find yourself in a situation just like this one? And it can be tricky, Devin, because DWSD needs to know who's responsible for the yeah, bill. So a yeah. few things here. You need to make sure that you have a rental agreement and a utility agreement with your landlord. Who's going to pay for what and when? You also have to make sure all of that information is spelled out in a lease and that you have a copy of that lease. And finally, if things go wrong like they did in this situation, contact DWSD. Let them know you need help. Oftentimes they will work to intervene and get in touch with the landlord to make sure they have the proper paperwork. Devin, back yeah, to you. Solid steps. Don't take the shortcuts around those. All right, Hank. Mm -hmm.